from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. In order to support the vision of a sixth data platform, that is a capability which allows a globally consistent, real-time, intelligent digital representation of a business, we believe the industry has to rethink this idea of a single system of truth. Specifically, we envision a new data platform that marries the best of relational and non-relational capabilities and breaks the multi-decade trade-offs between data consistency, availability, and global scale. Now further, we see the emergence of a modular data platform that automates decision-making by combining historical analytic systems with transactions to enable AI to take action. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I welcome two innovators, Eric Berg, who is the CEO of Fauna, and Soma, 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 Soma Segar, who's the Managing Director at Madrona Ventures. Gents, welcome. Thanks very much for spending some time with us today. Dave, made to be here, and thank you for having us here. Yeah, you bet. Great to be here, too. All right, before we get into it, we want to set the context with a little bit of spending data from ETR. So this is a spending intentions survey data from the January survey of 1,766 IT decision makers. And what we're doing here is we're showing some of the top operational data platforms. The vertical axis represents net score, which is a measure of spending momentum on a specific platform. And the horizontal axis shows the presence of that platform within those 1,700 plus accounts. You can see the table insert on the lower right. It shows you the data for, for each company and how it's plotted. That informs the placement of the dot. That red dotted line at 40%, anything over that indicates a highly elevated spending velocity level. Now we've stretched the ETR taxonomy a bit here, so let me explain. The categories used in the survey, they don't break out operational from analytic databases. So we know that pure plays like Mongo represent operational data stores, but the, the, the asterisk indis, indicates that several firms like Microsoft, AWS, I, IBM, et cetera, comprise multiple database types. So that said, the following key points are things that we want to note. First of all, Microsoft's ubiquitous as they always are in these surveys. They got a huge N in the data set. And within the portfolio, we've highlighted Cosmos DB, which is Microsoft's globally distributed NoSQL and, and relational database. PostgreSQL, it's an open source database, it's an alternative to Oracle, and while it's not in the main spending survey, we've, we've, we, we have data in other surveys that suggest it's very prominent, so we've sort of estimated its position on this chart in context. AWS, as you know, they've got dozens of databases. We've highlighted DynamoDB and Aurora, two of its most popular operational databases. AWS, as you can see, is at the highest net score or spending momentum in this data at a 51% net score. You've seen Google just at that 40% mark, not as much market share. And we've highlighted Spanner, which is its globally distributed, strongly consistent database. And part of the, the theme of this uh, research today. And then Mongo, a pure play operational data platform. You also see SAP HANA. It's got strong spending momentum. And then several other players on the graphic, including MariaDB, Cockroach Labs, and of course, IBM and Oracle. The latter, with Oracle Database and the more novel MySQL HeatWave, which combines transactions and analytics and an in-memory architecture. Okay, so this lays out a picture of operational data stores. Now, to get a new vision of the single source of truth, we need these operational data stores to be married with historic analytic data. Now with AI, we bring intelligence to begin to enable automation, systems of agency, and we can begin to build what we call intelligent data apps. So SOMA, Madrona each year has your IA Summit, Intelligent Apps. Explain your point of view on what are intelligent data apps, please. Great, thanks Dave. So uh, this will be actually, if I remember right, this will be the fourth year that we'll be doing our Intelligent Application Summit this fall day. And the reason we started doing this uh, a few years ago is because we saw that the that the world is is going through a transformation where like you know hey if you look back like you know say 10 15 years ago kind of thing the world was moving from what i call on premises applications to saas software as a service applications and we felt a similar transformation was was likely to happen and we started talking about it back, even back in 2015 
but the, but the notion that like you know hey every application in the world is going to become an intelligent application and by definition what that really means is if you're not an intelligent application your shelf life is uh, what should i say is finite okay and what do i mean when i say intelligent applications you know as we all know there has been like you know an explosion of data applications have access to more data and and these applications today are being built with a continuous learning system in place so that they look at the data that they have they train whatever models they need to train they learn and then they deliver a service they get more data and then they learn more and it's sort of a continuous learning system that the application has and that's what makes the application or a service that much more valuable to people right and we felt that given the like we thought that every application is going to be an intelligent application we thought it would be a it would be a good thing for us to do working with the rest of the industry to identify what are the top 40 uh, intelligent application companies in the world at least in the private company space and we thought like you know hey that would be a good thing to sort of work with the industry identify and then be able to publish that list and then you know, bring those founders and ceos and investors together for a one day conference on what is happening as far as uh, intelligent applications and ai goes kind of thing and that's sort of been the context behind why we did that great thank you so Ma, let me jump in for a second and ask um part of the focus of of our narrative has been on how the the data platform is evolving to support these types of applications and you know sometimes you can find like a lighthouse example um not just of the applications but an attempt at building the platform to support those applications one example we use for the application side is uber where you have riders and drivers and fares um but another platform company that has attempted to enable these digital represents representations of things that are driven by data is palantir but there's something missing in in that platform which which we think is transactions where where you need to perform operations that re require shared visibility help us help walk us through how the platform needs to expand to support absolutely. that yeah absolutely before i answer that directly uh, george let me let me uh, uh, quote a statement that microsoft made in one of its uh, recent earning call actually the recent earning call that happened earlier this week okay uh, as as uh, you know dave was mentioning earlier uh, microsoft has its own like you know cosmos db kind of thing uh, which is a uh, you know no sql you know document relational database kind of thing but in that context microsoft was saying like you know hey if you really want a go to database to build ai powered applications at any scale okay you need a, a document relational database that sort of you know validates why you know in some sense i would say fauna exists and what we've been sort of focused on building over the last many years and why we are super excited about what a data system or a data platform like what fauna has may be helpful having said that let me talk sort of take a step back and then talk about some of the attributes that i think these data systems need to think about or need to evolve to have uh, to meet these demands okay first and foremost like you know gone are the days when like you know everything is going to be just structured data okay uh, there is a there is a, a a growing need for what we refer to as semi structured data structured data unstructured data semi structured data kind of thing but really like you know for the kinds of decisions that you want to make for the kinds of experiences that you want to enable that are ai driven and ai powered you really need to be able to handle uh, at least semi structured data if not more okay so that's sort of one important thing the second thing is the, the your customer base is really a worldwide customer base they can be from any part of the world can i think and you ought to be able to have a data system that is able to provide what we call like you know super fast very responsive and low latency experiences no matter where you are coming from it doesn't matter whether you are you know in the same uh, as uh, you know zone as i am in or you know in like you know in a completely opposite part of the world kind of thing right so being able to have a globally distributed data system with low latency that is super fast in terms of responsiveness is 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 absolutely essential the third thing is things are changing fast okay like you know what is what is the hot today may not be hot 6 months from now which means like you know all these intelligent applications need to be moving at sort of lightning speed kind of thing in terms of new capabilities in terms of new things that they are doing and so you want to be able to have a data system that provides a a seamless developer experience 
that enables you to be able to build those cap capabilities in a very agile way. Okay. Finally, you also need to make sure that the data that stays in your system, data platform or data system, is highly, highly secure, and you and you are willing and able to comply with the ever-changing, you know, privacy requirements and other data security requirements from different parts of the world. Because, like, hey, one part of the world may say something is important, the other part may say something else is more important, and you need to have a system that can really look at all of these holistically and be able to. Uh, you know, comply and manage through those, you know, sort of, and or navigate through those things in a in a in almost a real time world, right? So these are some of the things that I think of as like you know core attributes that data systems need to have in place today. Okay, great, thank you. And, and so, Eric, we're going to bring you into the conversation, uh, sure. but but let me set it up uh, if I can with this next graphic, which highlights some of the trade offs that we have had to make over the years. So George and I were talking last night and, and we use this metaphor, George, thank you for coming up with this, of the Gordian knot and to describe some of the challenges that we faced. So the legend of the Gordian knot says that whomever can untie the seemingly intractable knot is going to rule all of Asia. Asia. We're going to come back to that. So today we're exploring how to rethink the single system of truth and untangle that knot with unconventional method, uh, methods. So the idea is combining the best of, 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 of SQL's ability to join data and the schema flexibility of, of not only SQL, and then solving for globally distributed consistency without the complexity of having things like hardware-based atomic clocks and further you know, to con continuing on that thinking, breaking the trade-offs, we've been talking earlier about two-phase commit, um, having to choose between waiting for synchronization and scaling out nodes globally, addressing it, what Brewer's theorem or, other, or otherwise known as cap theorem problem, which says it's impossible for a distributed data store to accommodate more than two of three key attributes, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, which is a fancy way of saying when things go bad between nodes, the system can recover without losing data. So imagine a world where you didn't have to make these trade-offs. How would that change the way applications are written and the value proposition to customers? So come back to that idea of a Gordian knot Alexander the Great slashed the knot with his sword. In essence, he solved this impossible problem with an unconventional approach that broke the accepted rules and removed the constraints. Eric, that brings me to Fauna. What has Fauna done to rethink these trade-offs and essentially slash open that Gordian knot? Yeah, great question. And and I'll 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 start that answer by sort of oriented around the, you know, the customer in our case, you know, developer and engineering team challenges. And, and I think, you know, Soma mentioned a lot of them, um, you know, so start with, with the data itself, right? As Soma mentioned, uh, today's data, you know, in these internet facing cloud native applications uh, are certainly semi-structured. And so, you know, they need a database and an operational database that can accommodate that. Uh, and uh, I think as you, you mentioned this in, in, your, in your prelude, uh, sometimes it's great to be able to start with that unstructured data, but as applications, uh, you know, get more mature, as teams working on those applications get larger, you want to be able to add that structure uh, over time. And so, uh, you know, in Fauna, we we introduced kind of into that that theme of the best of SQL and NoSQL, uh, that underlying sort of document model, but with the ability to apply schema and and enforce that schema over time, you know, as your application grows. Uh, you mentioned and, and, and Soma mentioned, um, hey, these audiences uh, that people are building these intelligent applications for are, you know, uh, national uh, at, at minimum and, and, and usually global in, in, in basis. And so they want to provide fast, uh, you know, uh, interactive, responsive solutions uh, to those to those customers. And so that's where our underlying uh, what we call our distributed transaction engine it allows Fauna to run in a, in a multi-region concept. And that can either be, you know, across multiple regions in the EU or in, in, in the US or even globally based on your configuration. So it allows customers to build applications, these intelligent applications that are responsive for users, you know, across the globe. And then um, I think a really important point and, and probably a weakness of the database traditionally um, is that, you know, uh, someone brought up the, the point about agility. Um, you know, historically, the database has always sort of been this this part of the application stack that no one wanted to touch because it was very fragile. Uh, and we've done a lot to to ensure that that Fauna can really be a first class citizen in that kind of agile software development lifecycle that's that's needed. So 
it, it starts with that data model that I talked about when you start out on an application and, and you're not sure what the requirements are and how you're going to have to add features and capabilities to compete and to respond to your customers. You need that flexibility that you don't get, you know, out of a, out of a SQL database. And, and again, with the ability to add that structure over time, um, you know, the other thing that we've done that's pretty innovative is, um, you know, there's a, been a lot of work in the industry more broadly to automate uh, processes across the software development cycle with, you know, uh, infrastructure as code platforms like, uh, like, like Terraform and, and Pulumi, uh, or, you know, automated processes from, you know, things like GitHub. And so we've actually taken that concept and internalized that with Quantum. So we have a schema language that you can fully uh, identify and drive all of your configuration for your database. And what that means now is as you have, uh, you know, a, a software development lifecycle from and you store your code in GitHub, for example, and you're iterating and deploying that, you can just store your schema language for Fauna right along with that. And that database becomes every bit as flexible and agile uh, as changes to your code. And then the final piece of that, uh, of that agility, which is super important, um, uh, you know, we've kind of taken the concept if, you know, databases used to run on premise, a lot of those that you showed on, uh, your slide up front are database as a service, but in, still in that concept, you need to know about the physicality of the database. You pick a machine size, memory, et cetera. And we've taken that abstraction up another level with Fauna. So it, it, it is served up as an API. So, uh, none of our customers have to worry about sharding and replication and those kind of capabilities. And so it really makes it, um, you know, agile. Uh, you know, a couple of the things I'll just hit on quickly, uh, you know, uh, so, some have mentioned these interactive collaborative experiences. A lot of these intelligent applications are being reimagined uh, as native cloud services. And so collaboration and interactive kind of like that Google Docs like, uh, you know, capability in the UI is important. And Fauna has, uh, uh, you know, natively a real time event streaming capability that enables that in those UIs. And then, you know, the last thing that I'll talk, hit on is, and I think, um, uh, you know, Soma mentioned this is security and data residency. Um, we have a really interesting capability within Fauna where you can spin up multiple, uh, you know, databases. We have a multi-tenancy inherent in it. A lot of our customers, whether they're B2B SaaS customers or B2C, use that as a secure container to capture the data uh, for their customers allows them to meet their security requirements much easier. And then globally, we have Fauna deployed in these multi-tenant region groups, but provide a very seamless way for you as an application uh, to route all your requests to the right database in the right region, which is a great way to deal with um, you know, data residency requirements. So um, lot, lots of things that you know you can do when you uh, you know when you do build a, a database uh, you know from scratch. As as uh, Soma mentioned, it takes a while, uh, you know, to to do this, and we've been working on it, uh, you know, for quite some time. Uh, but uh, but you know, it's uh, it, you can really achieve a lot for customers, um, you know, by by doing so. Great, thank you, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, so on this program, George and I, we often talk about working with strings, in other words, stuff that databases understand, like rows and columns. Yep. and things, uh, objects that represent people, places, and, and things. And, and so George, maybe you could set this up and explain the core issue here where we want to preserve the simplicity of working with objects, but at the same time, we want the ability to, to take multiple views of the data, what we re refer to as strings. So yeah, Eric, just to, to drill down on this, that, you know, in, in the theme of marrying the best of Mongo and the best of Spanner, um, help it explain why, like you can st you can work with uh, what starts out as a schemaless, what seems like a schemaless um, database, but then, as you said, as the application evolves and you might have different um, views of that data, you can still get that capability that SQL would give you with you know, essentially the ability to join, but the, the the developer still gets to work with objects, you know, with things, and but the database has the key, the flexibility of of working with strings that that it can join. Can can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think that um, you know you're getting to the core, uh, you know, data model innovation, uh, um, you know, that we refer to as document relational, and um, you know, for, for database historians, I think we have to go all the way back to, you know, Cod's original paper, uh, you know, on the relational database. And at that time, he, he, he tightly coupled the relational 
model or relational capability to the you know tabular rows columns uh, uh, you know tables. And what we've done is is effectively you know uh, sort of apply kind of the the modern data requirements and developer requirements, uh, uh, frankly, that are we think are more aptly suited in 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 JSON and in document form, but brought the power of that relational model. There's there's nothing fundamentally um, that that prohibits the relational model from being applied to a different you know underlying data model. It just so happens that that's kind of you know traditionally how it's been defined that those two things have been have been tightly coupled. And and then you brought up something else which is very important. And you you can't it, you know we found that you can't just iterate on the underlying you know data model. But as you mentioned, it has to come through also to how the developers interface with that. And uh, you, you brought up a really good point and 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 one that we saw as we talked to customers about their constraints. Uh, you know, with SQL. SQL was was great when you needed to return a result that was in rows and tables for you know reporting uh, you know situation, which is kind of what it was developed for initially. But when you think about how data usually needs to be returned from an application development standpoint, and you know to to populate a user interface, for example, uh, you can't uh, you can't really achieve that with SQL today. And and so you know our our query language, um, if developers are you know, very familiar with TypeScript or JavaScript or Python or Go or a modern programming language, they'll feel right at home uh, in, in FQL. And it is it is set so that, that you know, those object-oriented programmers, you know, can uh, interact with their data in a very natural way. And as you said, almost more importantly, they can return that data, uh, you know, to the application in a way that, um, you know, that is required. And you want to do that uh, in in one shot if you can, right? And and in a consistent way, which is where our underlying you know strong consistency model uh, comes in in place. And everything with Fauna is a transaction, so you can submit that and get that back, and then and then return it to your UI in a in a natural way. Just to one be clear. Oh, Samu, go ahead. Sorry, no, no. One one thing that just warmed my heart when Eric was talking about was when he mentioned uh, TypeScript. And the reason I mentioned that is because, like you know, I was in uh, Microsoft in running developer division when we were working on uh, a new language, you know, on top of uh, JavaScript called TypeScript kind of thing, and we put out the the programming language for the rest of the world when I was there. And it is it is fantastic to see how far the language come along and like you know has come along, and uh, how much you know Fauna is being able to use that to really provide a, what I call a very simple uh, developer experience. And so let, let me just elaborate on that, Dave, before we move on, because this, I think, is really important where, like, a relational database, say Oracle, could support JSON objects on top of an underlying relational model. But if I understand, they, it's still schema on write, so the developer still has to declare the, the data model of the database before they get started. And if I understand what you're saying, um, yours can evolve as the application requirements evolve until uh, the the d developer or the data architect feels like they they want to nail it down. Is that yeah? I think right. That that's absolutely right. I think there's two key differences. I think you know the fundamental question is well, can I just store JSON documents in a in a tabular database and be done with it? I mean, I think there are two constraints. There's there's one absolutely that you mentioned, which is that ability to start with a flexible data model and then add the schema. You know, over time, as you as you hone in on the the structure, and as I mentioned, you know, su we support schema enforcement as well as as you would in a relational database. The other piece is, uh, you know, you you brought up earlier as well, which is, uh, you're still then constrained with the query language that you're working with there, you know, SQL and that tabular data model, not being able to bring back data in the structure that's required and needed by your application, and so. When you have a more expressive query language that, again, it's more similar to TypeScript or JavaScript or Python, it allows the application developer to do that. So, I mean, you can talk to a lot of application developers, uh, and 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 they want that kind of power in the in the language that they use with data, just as they do with their application code. And just again, to to nail this down and be clear, you're trading the the declarative query of SQL. In other words, the the ability to just say what you want and have the database figure out how to get it because that's really useful for complicated queries in analytic databases. And here, you don't mind expressing how to get the data in 
in a TypeScript-like language because then you get to deal with the objects or things that your your application type system cares about. Correct. That, and I and then the other thing I would add to that, and you know, um, you know, you know that that our co-founders experienced a lot as they were sort of scaling the different data infrastructures in their careers is that you also get when you have that query optimization layer, you get very inconsistent performance and 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 performance that you can't really predict. And so, uh, you know, as a developer who's starting to build a system that really scales, there's there's a real trade off that's you know valuable to be able to sort of dictate that, if you will, right? Okay, right. Okay, great. Let's let's move on. So one of the, I mean, when we talk to our community and our, the IT decision makers in our in our in our audience, they want to know, you know, they want to know the gotchas. So let's d double click a little bit. In particular, when we looked at at Fauna, we're like, okay, where are the bottlenecks? And one of the, I imagine you yep. get this question a lot. For example, if your transaction log is in a single availability zone, what happens if you lose it? And if it's not in a single availability zone, how do you ensure that you can maintain performance? Maybe you could address that and, may, and maybe put us on the spectrum of you're strongly consistent, you, you know, how, where you fit from a performance standpoint with eventual consistency. Help us understand that, if you would, please. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the the first thing you mentioned back to to cap theorem, um, you know, there there is no magic of the, you know, formally we are a CP system, right? And and the way we deal with availability is through replication of, of nodes in, in in our multi-region uh, you know, capability. So what are the what are the trade-offs, if you will, right, of this system? I think it gets back to one of my earlier uh, you know, answers, which was you know, fundamentally, one thing that Fauna cannot escape is the speed of light and right. and 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 the, the physics and the delays of that. Right. And so, um, you know, our, for example, a a write to Fauna that's going to be consistent across regions um, will take uh, in the double digit milliseconds. Uh, whereas with an eventually consistent system that doesn't have to worry about that consistency, that might be single digits. Now, on the flip side, because we are distributed geographically. Um, we can serve up, you know, simple reads in single millisecond uh, in the instances, and you know, very close to the user, and and that's also very different from, um, you know, another thing that you mentioned on your on your not slide, and, you know, traditionally these systems have had, uh, you know, two phase commit as their consensus algorithm, and and that could uh, bring up a lot of contention uh, on particular data, and it could be a lot of variability in in how fast they can serve those reads. But again, you know, based on the the design of our distributed tran transaction engine and our consistent sort of global log, we're able to get around that and have a more uh, consistent, predictable performance. So the the big the big trade off really is um, is the speed of light and the and the and the you know the the slight delay in in writes uh, for strong consistency. And then um, you know again we take care of the you know kind of the the replication on the back end of the service. Uh, to make up for you know availability potential availability and just to, and to be really clear about your your specific question you know our our log does not run in a single availability zone at a minimum each one of what we call our our public region groups where we run you know multi-tenant instances of of fauna for our customers uh, by definition spans at least three different geographical areas so if like for in the in the U.S. we'll have presence in the East Coast Central and and West Coast. In EU, well, about about three different countries, and then we have global region groups that 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 span, um, you know, the span geographic boundaries as well. Got it. Okay, so there's if if there's a problem, there's a very 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 high probability you'll be able to to recover. I always say there's no such thing as as zero data loss, despite some right. of the products that we've seen out there. But you've architected that, and again, as you say, the trade off is speed of light, and I'm sure I'm sure the best minds in our industry are working on that. Um, so uh, on Fauna's webpage, there's a section that really caught our attention, Why Fauna, where you discuss, you know, uh, a number of Fauna relative to a number of other platforms. It was actually really informative. I thought quite, uh, quite fair, uh, although we'll, we'll, we'll hear from your competitors. But there was Fauna uh, versus DynamoDB, uh, 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 or Fauna's an, an alternative. You cited the challenges of cost and consistency that Dynamo has at scale. You had Fauna versus Mongo, where you talked about some of the scale and consistency and constraints of the latter. Fauna versus Postgres, where you discussed the challenges of working with schema on write. As George was just talking about the lack of strong consistency when it's geo-distributed. You had Aurora Serverless as another one, uh, V2, which addresses some of the limitations of Postgres. 
fauna versus spana, which was not on your website, I don't think. This is just sort of our thinking, which stresses the consistency in a geo-distributed situation, but still requires that two-phase commit trade-off that you just talked about and schema on right. So Eric, your competitors are really entrenched. They're well-financed. They got large customer bases, as we showed in that spending data. Many have momentum. So do your best to summarize your point of view on the limitations of today's popular operational systems and share how you stack up. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, and we all know, I think that the operational database market is, you know, I think if if not not one of it is the largest, you know, market from an IT spend, and so as a result, there are a lot of different players. So the way I like to, you know. Uh, sort of attack this is kind of how how we see our customers making decisions right and so so fundamentally there is a there is a there is a branch at the top of the tree right where if if people have you know existing applications for example that are wed to SQL for example and they're looking for a way to move that to the to the cloud and SQL kind of is their you know query language of choice um, which brings in, you know, Postgres and and a lot of the RDS systems and Cockroach and others that you met, mentioned. You know, clearly that's not something that 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 Fauna is focused on. It, independent of whatever those architectural differences are, you know, that that query language choice makes a makes a makes a big difference. Um, so, you know, today, you know, we 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 do see still people who will go from, you know, say Postgres uh, to Fauna, and it's typically because you know, they hit that multi-region, that expansion problem, and they're really looking for a way to um, to not have to take on all of those cross data center challenges themselves. And in that case, they're actually willing to migrate from, you know, uh, something like Postgres or SQL to Fauna. Um, you know, probably easier today is if people have made that choice up front and said, hey, you know, the, the, the flexibility, the scalability, uh, the performance of, of NoSQL is more important to me. And, uh, you know, for those customers, it, it really, you know, we, we are bringing to them all of the, the power of a relational database that they sort of had to give up uh, as they moved to, to NoSQL. Um, so I can kind of walk through that for each one of those really quickly. I mean, DynamoDB is a, is a great one where, you know, I think they were one of the earliest and, and largest, most popular serverless databases. And so I think they did a great job on that front. Um, but if you talk to customers and you get into Dynamo, I mean, it kind of goes back to what Dynamo was designed for initially, which was really to, you know, offload a, a hotspot on a relational database and horizontally be able to scale, you know, read requests with that very quickly. And for those kind of use cases is extremely uh, useful. Dynamo has a lot of trade-offs. They have a very rigid uh, data model. It's called a single table design. And so kind of like what we were talking about earlier, if you know exactly what your application is going to evolve to and exactly what the, you know, read, write, uh, you know, patterns are going to be, then it's a great solution. Uh, but that doesn't apply to most people who are building and evolving and changing their application. Uh, Dynamo by default is, you know, single region. It takes a lot of work to try to make it work across regions. And then also, you know, by default, it's eventually consistent. Um, you know, you can pay a lot more and again, you know, try to configure it to, to approximate strong consistency, but you absolutely don't get that out of the box. So a lot of differences there when it, when it, when it comes to, to Fauna. Um, you know, Mongo is a, is a great example. And, you know, one that we look at in terms of answering your question of how do you, you know, how do you grow a new, you know, franchise in this market. You know, one of the things that I think Mongo did very well is they they intercepted a lot of you know net new development, uh, and then grew with their customers. And and um, and and that's you know that's a big part of of how Fauna started out as well is you know attracting these modern developers who are building these new applications. Sometimes it's in very large enterprises. You know, time sometimes it's in in smaller customers. And now increasingly, we're also starting to see people. You know, migrate off of that, and so that that's a, a little bit of an answer to your question of how do you build a new, you know, operational database franchise. Uh, you, you know, you really have to attract this next generation, all these intelligent applications that we're talking about, and and be able to get in at the ground floor, or as people are thinking about kind of reimagining those those services. So again, someone like you know a, a Mongo. Uh, again, you know, they, they have the document piece uh, down, which I think is is great because that's you know sort of fundamental and core to us. But we brought all that relational capability that you don't get, uh, and then we've abstracted the operational, uh, you know, level level up so that you have a you know a pure API. So instead of you know like for example their 
popular Atlas service, you still have to know about the hardware underlying the service. Um, again, with Fauna, that's you know completely taken care of for you, and it's and it's uh, and it's available globally. And then you know the last thing I'll mention is while they have a query language that is not you know SQL, it's relatively limited in terms of what you can do as a developer. And back to our earlier conversation, you know FQL is at a very expressive language, you know similar again towards you know TypeScript and Python, and 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 uh, and it allows developers a lot more power, in, you know the relations, the joins, etc but also in terms of how they structure their data for their application. So it's much more developer friendly. Great. Yeah, thank Let you. Let me ask, Go ahead, Dave, Dave. just a, a follow-up. Sort of popping back up a level where we have the these future intelligent data applications, using Uber as an example, um, where um, things in the real world change, like a, a rider you know, requests a driver the system has to match the match the rider with the driver. It has to calculate a fare and a route and an ETA. What we're trying to understand is um, how much of that app lives in this real-time system of truth, which then orchestrates all the other transactions to the extent there are transactions, and how much lives in the historical system of truth. And, you know, who orchestrates that whole flow, where that happens? Can you elaborate and sort of enlighten us? Yeah, I mean, I think like any application decision, there's there's trade-offs in terms of uh, how you do that. And I'm, I'm sure and you look at any application, it probably, um, you know, there's different ways to solve that. Uh, in particular, you know, we're a, you know, we're sort of a fan of a, a best of breed and, and and having strong integration with systems that that do things uniquely well. Uh, so for example, you know, we're, we're not we're not, you know, we're not focused um, on, you know, the compute historical reporting kind of traditional OLAP uh, workloads. Even, you know, I'll, I'll bring up something that's popular these days. You know, we haven't really pursued uh, vector capability. We've decided to partner with, you know, Pinecone and others who are best of breed in in, in that area. Um, and so, you know, I, that it, I think it also speaks a little bit to our architecture and the kind of applications that we see being built, right? We we are an API. We're consumed by it as an API. And so it's very easy to integrate Fauna into a, a more kind of event-driven, kind of, you know, loosely coupled architecture like that. So, you know, I think our, our answer in terms of what we see is is that, you know, we are doing that core uh, transactionality, you know, uh, you know, determining where the uh, you know, wh where the issues are and, and resolving them. And we'll get fed from, you know, either results that might be done offline in a batch mode that then update, you know, information in Fauna that, that, that you know, partakes in that query and, and to, to actually resolve that issue of like, okay, new driver, new location, et cetera. So we'll be fed from those systems and vice versa, you know, we'll get, we'll get information out of Fauna into those uh, you know, warehouses, whether it's, you know, Snowflakes or Databricks or wherever that might, uh, you know, reside. So we sort of believe in a, in a, um, you know, in a, in a best of breed sort of integrated uh, architecture in that world. So just to be clear that like application objects like the rider and the driver might be fauna objects. And if they need to be informed about historical data, um, they would call on or, or be informed by the historical system of truth. But the application objects that need real-time state would live in Fauna. Correct. Okay. Um, I wanted to bring Soma back into the conversation. Soma, Eric was talking earlier about that the the majority of spend is on these type of, of operational systems. When I was I go back to the '90s when I was at IDC and we used to count this stuff. Uh, the vast majority of the spend was certainly on these you know transaction and operational systems. We can see the need for, uh, we see the rise, the ascendancy of unstructured data. It was the decade before Hadoop, but we saw the, the need for something like that. And we all know the good, the bad, and the ugly there. But Soma, how do you think about the Fauna's TAM, its market opportunity, how it's gonna tap uh, that opportunity with its routes to market? What was the investment thesis for you? And, and, and let, let me just add to that, Soma, to, to elaborate, like, how that market, the market seems to have shifted from emphasizing operational databases to analytic databases over the last X number of years. But when we have intelligent apps that are driven by data that need shared you know, visibility on transactions, how does that dynamic change again? Absolutely, absolutely. 
that's that's a great question dave the i think the sim the simple answer to to how i how we think about tam is it is huge <laughs> yeah it's humongous okay as as eric mentioned like you know hey the 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 operational databases is probably one of the if not the largest you know spend item in it budgets kind of thing and this been like you know the case for many many years now kind of thing and it's only growing as the world uses more data and as new kinds of applications come that sort of you know have a enormous appetite for this data kind of thing okay uh whether it is like you know 200 billion or 400 billion or 600 billion i think you know different people can come up with different charts and numbers but they are all you know large enough that we think like you know hey tam tam is not the issue here right the reason why we got excited about fauna i would say like you know two four one is if you look at the co-founders and the founding team for fauna kind of thing the pedigree and the background and the experience they've had building at scale data systems okay in other enterprises and seeing what is working and what is not working and being able to have a pulse for what do modern developers need in a in a database kind of thing uh we felt that that pedigree was was fantastic the second thing is as as we as we know that like you know data explosion is happening there's new class of applications whether it is you know intelligent applications whether it is applications on the edge whether it is iot driven applications there's a whole class of new applications that are coming in where like this notion of like you know hey they need uh, access to data in in a globally available way with a low latency and sort of a high performance kind of thing right and we felt like you know hey if somebody can pull together a system that meets all of these attributes in a serverless world then we thought like you know hey that's a that's a database uh, that that can have legs and can have a, a meaningful play in the ecosystem you know as you guys talked about like you know the competitive landscape there's a lot of database systems uh, so you have to be thoughtful that on the one hand there's a lot of uh, demand but there's also a lot of supply but as and when you see inflection points whether it is platform inflection or the kinds of applications that are being developed there is an inflection point you want to think about like you know hey what is the database system that makes best uh, that that provides the best uh, use case and best value for people who are building data driven applications or ai applications kind of thing and that's the reason why we got excited about fauna and we think like you know hey a system like fauna that's truly global truly available truly sort of you know uh, you know have has the consistency that people need in today's day and age in terms of being agile and being able to move things fast and around the world we thought there is a huge 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 opportunity so let me follow up on that because i think the look at i think the the answer that it's huge is is perfectly reasonable but it's also nuanced so and I'll, and i'll tell you what i mean by that so when i think of the early days of snowflake uh, it was very easy to understand okay snowflake's going to replace teradata installations because it's simpler or you take pure storage what's pure storage tam it was emc okay so it was it was a, a very disruptive in a market share steal now when you talk to snowflake the tam is data which is as you say my like mike scarpelli will say it's huge it's just it's unlimited so so you really are in that sort of uh, ladder category of you know giant so my question is since it sounds like you're not just saying okay we're just going to go steal from oracle or steal from teradata uh, teradata is a bad example in your case steal from mongo maybe there's some bleeding there but but specifically my question is what other conditions have to occur in order for you to tap that tam are there other dependencies that you're looking at to say okay these pieces have to come together or is it more hey there's a very clear vector of new innovation and in, and in, and in, in value creation that we're tapping does that does that question make sense to you yeah absolutely right just just so, just just to go back to your point dave uh because i was also an investor in snowflake i have some knowledge of this kind of thing i i could tell you that like you know when snowflake started it was really like you know hey how do i build the best data warehousing solution that's cloud based okay and then over a period of time they said like you know hey you know you know data warehousing is great how do i get into data sharing okay and then over a period of time they started thinking about like you know hey how do i build a data cloud platform and like you said dave they talk about data all the way right so they their time has been sort of increasing as their footprint and their aspiration has been increasing now if you come to fauna can i think i i i think there are two two interesting use cases to think about one like you know like eric mentioned kind of thing right you know when when somebody is using an existing database solution and they've reached a level of scale or a or a level of geo expansion where they they feel that the current system that they have 
is not meeting their scale needs. They are looking for a new solution. How do we tap into that and get them, you know, excited about Fauna? So it's one of these cases where, like, you know, as much as migrating a database is hard, you know, people, if they if they want their application to continue scaling and being successful, at times they'll have to do this. And I think Fauna is in the right place to catch them and, and take it forward. The other thing is, as people go on and think about, like, you know, how do, how do they build net new AI-driven applications or applications on the edge or other kinds of applications that we talked about, I think they're going to look around and see, like, you know, hey, what is the system that is going to give me the best, you know, opportunity here? And I think, you know, Fauna is going to be probably at the top of the list, you know, when somebody thinks about it that way. So I think there are some cases where it is going to be like, you know, hey, Fauna is going to have the ability to steal from some other database system only because, like, you know, people have hit a scale limit or some other limit and are looking for a new solution. But as the as the pie becomes larger, I think Fauna has a chance to uh, have a have a, a meaningful part of the pie. Great, thank and you. If I, if I can, I can add to that. I totally agree. I mean, you know, a big part of what you have to do in one of these massive platform businesses, and 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 I've built a few of them, is exactly what Soma said. You have to sort of focus in on you know sort of your wedge initially. And, um, you know, even I'd, I'd go a, a, a step further, you know, and I know someone knows this, you know, in the, in the very early days uh, of Snowflake, it was, you know, failed Hadoop deployments uh, that, that, that they really were able to pick up uh, because they had great support for semi-structured data and, it, and, they, and they didn't have to do all of this data model conversion and they were able to go in there and swoop those up very early. You know, for us, you know, kind of the moral equivalent, as I was talking about earlier, is people who've said, hey, I'm... I want to go to documents. I want to go to NoSQL for that that flexibility, et cetera, but are really hitting pain points because uh, of the scale or you know the, the the desire to want to bring in you know relational capability, uh, the that kind of querying power at strong consistency, et cetera. And so that's kind of our you know failed to dupe, if you will, initially. Now fundamentally, because it is a document relational, and and as you guys started out your slide with the knot. You know, there's a massive opportunity o over time, uh, but you know, we're we're focused on kind of you know where the most pain is and where the the least you know sort of uh, you know religious tension is, if you will, uh, from a query perspective. And then you know, and then as 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 it you know gains scale, just like you know something like Snowflake, um, you know, you get to waves and broader and broader waves of of adoption, right? Uh, you know, as people's risk tolerance goes down. All right, awesome guys, we're gonna leave it there. Great conversation. Eric Berg, Soma, Soma Sager, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Great being here, Dave and, uh, Dave and George. Thank you for having us here. And yeah, thanks so much. You're very welcome. All right, I want to also thank Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman, who are on production, and Alex also handles our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight, they help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hoth is our editor-in-chief over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. If you want to get in touch, email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post. And make sure you check out etr.ai. etr.ai, outstanding survey data, best in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for George Gilbert and theCUBE Insights, powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis. Mm -hmm.